the you and me and our fancy new outfits. <laughs> the worst thing that you're ever going to go through with your dog has absolutely nothing to do with barking, chewing, reactivity, leash pulling, separation anxiety, or even health issues. One day, whether it's expected or unexpected, your dog is going to leave this physical world. Not only is this a painful adjustment, it's also an important reminder that every challenge over a dog's lifetime is both a limited time opportunity and a precious gift. Each time you cooperatively and respectfully work to understand your dog better, you build a beautiful and profound relationship with a unique and special soul. And in the process, you become a better person. My dog Keegan had many challenges, including epilepsy, hyperactivity, and sensitivity to eye contact from other dogs or people. He also had a very severe form of separation anxiety, which could and did sometimes trigger seizures. Over his lifetime, I was asked by different people if I might consider euthanizing him or giving him away. And though I never did consider those options, I sometimes doubted my ability to balance his special needs with my own needs. What I can confidently and truthfully say now is that every one of my struggles with Keegan has been an absolute blessing to me. How sad that the treasures some dogs have to offer are sometimes completely overlooked. I will also admit that in the early years of Keegan's life, I too was oblivious to all the gifts he offered me. I'm going to tell you what recently happened to my Keegan, also how I almost lost him nine years ago, and share with you some insights about our very colorful journey together so that maybe you'll also understand that your own struggles with your dog can be an incredible gift. If you've spent any time on my channel, you will probably know Keegan, my red border collie, from most of my videos, my thumbnail pictures, and my stories. In the beginning of April this year, my 12 and a half year old Keegan was looking healthy and bright, and though showing some signs of his age, he was doing pretty well. At the end of February, Keegan had blood testing because he was stiff after long car rides and not wanting to come out of his car crate right away. His blood testing looked pretty good though, aside from very slightly high cholesterol. But he was having some back issues and he got a referral to a physical rehabilitation program, which we started at the end of April. He also had a short bout of incontinence just before he started the physical rehab program. My vet gave him a shot of medication, which seemed to fix the issue. On May 5th, two days after physical therapy, I did some exercises at home with him and though he seemed happy to do the exercises, he later didn't want to eat his nighttime snack, which is not at all like Keegan. Keegan was never picky, and he absolutely loved his food, so that was not normal for him. I thought maybe his teeth were bothering him because Keegan had this love of pulling blackberry roots out of the dirt, and I'd been digging out blackberries earlier. I wondered if maybe he'd pulled out a blackberry root and damaged a tooth because he was still eating just not the hard crunchy food. I got him into a vet the following Monday and on that day he became visibly jaundiced. His eyes were yellow, his gums were pale, and his blood testing showed really high bilirubin levels amongst other concerning results. The vet thought that his blood results may have indicated a form of cancer that was affecting his liver. But there was also a possibility that it was something treatable, like an infection. An ultrasound to look at his liver couldn't be scheduled until Thursday. But Tuesday night, he had a nosebleed. So on Wednesday morning, I found another vet clinic to do the ultrasound right away. Keegan didn't have any visible tumors on his liver, and his blood was retested. The vet told me that Keegan's immune system was attacking itself and diagnosed him with immune-mediated hemolytic anemia, a disease I'd never heard of before. Keegan's blood results were very serious, but in speaking with the vet, we decided that because he was still eating and drinking, it was reasonable that I would treat him with the prescribed medication at home and come in for more blood testing on the following Monday. The emergency clinic options, even if they could take him, would mean that I couldn't be with Keegan. And because Keegan had a long history of separation anxiety, which in the past had triggered seizures, I knew that being away from home wasn't gonna be a good option for him. The vet said 
that he was optimistic at that point because Keegan was still eating a good amount of food. And I set out to learn a little bit more about immune-mediated hemolytic anemia. With encouragement, he was still eating a good amount of healthy food. He was drinking lots of water and even eating some crunchy cat food because he always loved cat food. He just didn't want kibble or hard foods at that point. Because his ultrasound didn't show tumors, I somehow felt like this might be something we could treat and that maybe he could still have a good quality of life. I also learned that in treating immune-mediated hemolytic anemia, known also as IMHA, that it can take a few weeks to see improvement. I prayed that if it could be in his highest good, that Keegan would reach his 13th birthday on August 18th of this year. We still had so much to do together, and I absolutely wasn't ready to let him go. On Friday, May 12th, a friend came over, and Keegan was wagging his tail, excited at the door to see her. He was sick, but he had his moments of looking brighter. When he didn't want to eat, I was doing some syringe feeding, but he was taking the food like a puppy, not refusing it, just gently lapping up what I gave him in the syringe. I was feeding him about four times a day to make sure it wasn't too much at once. I took him on stroller rides to my field and to one of his favorite places, my pond. Aww, such a good boy. You know, you're gonna get cold like that. On Saturday night, May the 13th, I syringe fed him some food and he actually fell asleep on my hand. He was so sweet and gentle. The poor little tyke was just so tired and he just didn't have a lot of energy. Sunday morning, he took some food again. He was just really tired and mostly needed to sleep. At one point though, he kept trying to head down the hill to his favorite spot at my pond, and so I drove him there. He wanted to go in the water, and so I let him. Good work. Do you need help? I can help you. Fine. I don't really want to help. All right, let's go. You're a good boy. Then on Sunday night, May 14th, my nightmare began. At 5 p.m., Keegan started to have a series of seizures from which he could not recover. He became confused and disoriented. After the last seizure, his body became limp, and by 10 p.m., I awkwardly carried him up my hill and managed to get him into my van to the emergency vet. The emergency staff met me at the car with a stretcher and gently transferred him. Once she had examined him, the vet at the emergency clinic made it very clear that he was not going to recover from the seizures and also said that she had never seen bilirubin levels as high as his testing results had shown earlier in the week. I don't think that seizures are normally typical with his immune condition, IMHA. Keegan did have epilepsy though, but he had gone for four years seizure-free until that evening. So at the clinic, I had to make the very difficult decision to let Keegan go on without me. I was grateful that he stopped having seizures once we got to the clinic. I was able to talk to him alone and let him know that he'd be going on a journey to see Sprite and Asha and Chance and his grandpa and other friends we knew that are on the other side. He was very quiet and it was very clear that his body was in the process of transitioning. His unscheduled vet assisted passing was not how he would have planned things, but it was peaceful and painless. Keegan was always my quirky problem child because of health problems, hyperactivity, and anxiety, which were all tied together. Keegan also had a big personality, and along with his challenges, he brought a huge enthusiasm and zest for life. I used to say that sharing life with Keegan was like having 10 dogs. To describe Keegan, a friend of mine said that some march to the beat of their own drum, but Keegan had his own full brass band. <laughs> and this is so true. So needless to say, it's very quiet without him. I've lost many pets over the years and it's always so difficult to let them go. But Keegan's passing was so dramatic and abrupt with a cluster of seizures and I was absolutely not ready. His death was just not on my agenda. I had much more I wanted to share about all the things we've recently accomplished together. His overcoming separation anxiety that had plagued him all his life and the many things that we continued to learn together. He was an older dog still learning new tricks and both of our lives were changing for the better. Keegan, through all his quirks and so-called issues, taught me more than any dog I've ever shared my life with. 
people would say to me, Keegan is so lucky to have you. But what they were really saying was, Keegan is lucky to have you and not me because no one in their right mind would put up with that. Keegan's special needs were mostly brain related, like a canine form of autism. Especially when he was younger, he had a lot of repetitive behaviors. He was distressed in new situations and he liked things to be very predictable. He was socially nervous and sensitive to touch. His separation anxiety could trigger seizures and he was hyperactive and a very, very busy boy. Okay, get it. He was also one of the smartest and most entertaining dogs I've ever known. He was a camera ham because he loved any type of interaction. He was often central to my videos and you'll see him in most of my thumbnail pictures on the channel because he was a pretty photogenic little camera ham. As painful as it is to get used to the loss of Keegan's physical body, which has been so much a part of my life for the past 12 and a half years, I also appreciate that he could have very easily left me nine years before. Nine years ago, within three days of his passing, when Keegan was only three years old, he nearly died from drowning. Before I knew that Keegan was epileptic, he had walked with me and my other three dogs at the time down onto my field and I'd lingered for a little while while he carried on through the open gate over to the pond. It took me less than a minute to catch up to him, but as soon as I turned the corner past the gate, I knew something was terribly wrong. Keegan was flailing in the water. He'd started having a seizure at the edge of the pond or, or maybe jumping onto his favorite raft. He had floated to the deep part of the water where it was about 10 feet to the bottom. I then watched Keegan's body go limp and his head dropped face down in the water, unmoving. Now the strange thing about the situation is that I'd had a recurring dream before the incident about a dog drowning. Sometimes in the dream it was a dog that I didn't recognize. In one dream it was my dog Asha, but I repeatedly had a dream about a dog struggling and drowning in the water. And so because of this dream, I spent some time thinking about what I might do if a dog actually did start to drown. I knew the water would be very cold, but I also knew that I wouldn't hesitate to go in. I also thought that I would grab a life jacket, but in real life, there was no time for that. Drowning happens very quickly, I discovered. I think the dreams had prepared me just enough to not hesitate in my response. I flung off my boots and waited to the drop off where I couldn't touch the bottom. Then I swam to Keegan, lifted his head, grabbed hold of the side of the raft, and I managed to get him to shore. I held him upside down to get the water from his lungs but he remained lifeless. I laid him on his side and I was alarmed to see his tongue, blue and limp, flopping out of his mouth onto the dirt. His eyes were unblinking and his jaw was rigid. The saddest moan escaped from his lungs. I'd heard a similar sound in my cat Ziggy's moment of death. Honestly, I couldn't clearly remember a lot of the emergency pet first aid that I'd taken previously and I probably should have given Keegan CPR. But in that moment, all I knew was that he had to breathe. And so I held my hands around his snout and I breathed into him. I realized that some of the air was escaping through his teeth, so I cupped my hands around his muzzle. As an aside, I've since heard that closing the mouth and breathing through the nose is a better way to avoid air escaping. Also, I'm not a medical expert. Anyway, I breathed into him and I could see that his stomach was rising. So he was getting air. At the time, I remember wondering how long I would do this before I would be forced to accept that he was gone. Would it be an hour, an afternoon, a day? I didn't have my cell phone with me to contact anyone, and it was going to be a long climb up my hill to the house. In those critical moments, breathing into him, I reflected on my relationship and role with Keegan and what had been many mixed feelings towards him. I brought this little border collie home to do Canada Goose Control, my job at the time, but he had not been the dog I expected. From three months old, he had health issues. He'd woken up one morning with severely swollen lymph nodes, which I didn't know was caused by infected teeth. Because at first I couldn't get an accurate veterinary diagnosis, he was in pain for weeks. Eventually, someone referred me to a veterinary dental surgeon who diagnosed his tooth issues. Expensive dental surgery fixed his teeth and his infection, but he had become understandably defensive towards other dogs that would come near his face. 
He was fearful of strangers and new dogs. He didn't like eye contact or uninvited handling from those he didn't know. He was concerned about men, kids, new dogs, and even people who smiled at him. I counter-conditioned, desensitized, and redirected his attention by teaching him a default nose touch when he was in uncomfortable situations. I'd tried puppy playdates, introduced him to gentle children and friendly men, but none of this had honestly helped him. He was rejected by dog daycare. People criticized and judged me and assumed Keegan's reactivity was caused by something either I was or wasn't doing. Of course, they had no idea how much time and effort I had actually been putting into this pup. Besides behavior training and his goose control work, I tried dog agility, trick training, tracking, herding, canine freestyle. I was fixated on learning how to conquer his fears and I watched videos, took workshops, read articles and books. I was determined that Keegan would be an upstanding canine member of society. Every day I went to our local waterfront park to train him. But confidence building and changing a dog's brain happens in small steps. Too much pressure of exposure to scary things can sometimes be just as unproductive as a lack of exposure. I realized eventually that fewer training sessions were better for both of us. At one point, it seemed like my life outside of training Keegan was just basically over. Goodbye social life, hello to life with a challenging dog. <laughs> at one of my lowest points, I wrote a request to the universe asking that if Keegan's behavior couldn't improve, for God to peacefully take him from me. Even then, looking into his soulful eyes, I could never have made that choice myself. Now, here I was trying desperately to breathe life back into him. My request had been granted, and I realized that it was the last thing that I wanted. As I breathed into this limp, unresponsive dog, I envisioned my new life without Keegan. I would be set free from all the responsibility of life with an anxious dog. No more separation anxiety, no more nervous reactions, no hyperactivity, no endless need to interact. But the problem was, I'd fallen in love with this eccentric and lovable dog, quirks and all, and my whole world was falling apart. After what seemed like an eternity, but was probably a short couple of minutes, he took a light breath, but then it stopped. So I kept going. Again, I noticed a breath emanating from him that didn't come from me. Each breath grew stronger. Then he blinked. Quietly laying on his right side, he slowly gained consciousness. I pushed his tongue back into his mouth and it stayed there. I don't know how much time transpired exactly, but it was likely about five to seven minutes from the time he started drowning to regaining consciousness. He was cold. So I held him and tried to warm him. After about five minutes or so, he actually got up. I was cold too, so I grabbed my jacket and at that time, Keegan headed to the side of the pond where I kept some dog toys for fetching. He actually wanted to play ball, but his healthy appearance was deceptive and within hours, he was at the emergency vet spitting up blood with aspiration pneumonia. He stayed overnight at the hospital on supplemental oxygen, while I continued to pray for him to be healed. In the morning, his blood oxygen levels were still not normal, but by later that afternoon, his blood oxygen went from 88 to 96. After two days in hospital and another couple of weeks recovering at home, he made a full recovery. You say hi to the people. Good boy, Keegan. You feeling better, Keegan? Are you feeling better? Can you say hi? Yeah, good job. I always wondered, at the moment of his drowning, what might he have experienced while he was out of his body, literally dead for a short time? Was he given the choice to move on or come back to me? When he returned, I had hoped that his near-death experience would have transformed him into a calm and wise dog without so many anxieties and health issues. But that was not to be. Keegan's challenges came right back with him even after near death. I think it was a part of his life's mission because without those challenges, he and I never would have formed such a rich and rewarding relationship. 
Living with Keegan was not only a choice, but a true privilege. I am so incredibly grateful that he gave me an additional nine years of life. Because of Keegan, I continued to expand and develop my own understanding of dogs. I became a certified pro dog trainer and a separation anxiety certified coach. Keegan motivated me to understand how to help nervous and stressed dogs. He learned ways to relax, to settle, and to resettle. He became very good at ignoring other dogs and trusted me to give him adequate space. He became more flexible, more trusting, and more able to accept new people, new dogs, and new situations. He was always an eager student and always willing to participate in any exercise or game I threw his way. I also learned to notice certain pre-seizure symptoms in Keegan and was able to give him medication that would prevent him from having a seizure. My guess is that the combination of learning relaxation skills combined with medicinal treatment ahead of a seizure and maybe the addition of some specific supplemental medication is the reason why he did not have another seizure for an incredible four years until the night that he passed. With separation anxiety, he also made incredible progress, finally starting an effective training program at 11 years old. If I had had the resources and knowledge years sooner, I know that he could have overcome his separation issues earlier in life. But nevertheless, he achieved so much at this older age. His separation issues were very complicated. Since his anxiety could trigger seizures, he had to be kept separate from the other dogs when doing departure training because of the danger to both him and them <laughs> if he did have a grand mal seizure. Incredibly, we worked out solutions for all of that. I renovated a separate safe area for him, had it insulated, bought an air conditioner and a white noise machine. I spent three months making this his happy place and his happy place it was. He did so well and the training significantly helped him learn to relax and de-stress. I'm so proud of him for that. Eventually I will share our separation anxiety story because he accomplished some amazing things for a senior dog with health problems and I do think that needs to be shared. The name Keegan means little fire. I had a hunch when he came to me that this red border collie with huge spirit was going to be a challenge. Keegan never did anything halfway. Everything Keegan did was an event in itself and he made me laugh every day. He had a giant sense of humor. I could just look at him a certain way or use a funny voice and he would make a kind of doggy happy sound which was his equivalent of laughter. He had little quirky behaviors like giving my visitors a house tour of the laundry and bathroom drains which were apparently very fascinating to him. He loved to splash in the water and dig and get covered in as much mud as possible. Keegan proved to me that every struggle is an opportunity to grow an amazing bond with your dog and a special relationship that is invaluable and irreplaceable. It was an honor to share life with Keegan. He gave me so much joy and purpose. Our difficult problem dogs change our lives forever and make us more patient, more tolerant, more flexible, more creative, more appreciative, more accepting and a more loving human being. Keegan will always be my little fire. Good. <laughs>